We're joined today by Malik Rosamni, who is a American Lebanese researcher based in Paris and Beirut. And we're going to talk about the Druze faith, the concept of reincarnation, and how it affected politics during and after the Lebanese Civil War. Thanks for coming on, Malik. Oh, thank you. Thank you for, I'm really happy to be here. So you recently presented this paper about Druze and reincarnation in the Lebanese Civil War. Can you just briefly give a background of, you know, what is Lebanon? Who are the Druze? What was the Civil War? What do they believe about reincarnation? Sure. The paper was a broad look at reincarnation, kind of how it functions um, in the Druze community of Lebanon. I dealt with the Civil War in the third chapter, but um, it, it covers a bunch of different things, which we can get into later. What's unique about Lebanon politically that a lot of people may or may not know is the kind of sectarian system, even beyond the political, but kind of the, the political imagination that underlies sectarianism, which I, I think is interesting. Each religious community is kind of imagined and treated as a kind of, uh, has this political legibility and kind of existed maybe in the late Ottoman period, as kind of its own little, as kind of a self-defined community within the nation. And then you can only exist as a Lebanese citizen through your respective religious category. So there are like 17 um, officially recognized sects, uh, 13 Christian sects, and four um, Islamic sects. Civil law is has to be through your respective religious community. And Every district that votes for their deputies in the parliament, there is a quota per area. So let's say, you know, a certain district of Beirut might allow three Sunni deputies, uh, two Maronite deputies, Maronite being the predominant form of Christianity in Lebanon, one Druze deputy and a Shia deputy. And then the president has to be a Maronite Christian. Prime minister has to be a Sunni Muslim, the Speaker of Parliament has to be Shia Muslim and so on and so forth. Um, Like the four major, you know, groups, it could be like the Christians include within the many different sects, Sunnis, Shia, and then Druze. So Lebanon is like a weird, it's a secular state, but it's a state in which you are required to participate in a confessional community. Yeah, somehow, exactly. There's no like atheist or whatever deputies. Politically, no. Right. Politically, no, because, because, uh, it's not even a matter of belief so much. It's a matter of like belonging to a religious nation. So that I argue, I try to argue in my paper actually that um, sectarianism is kind of a religious nationalism. So it's basically the imagination of nationalism as defined. I really draw inspiration from Benedict Anderson on this, but it's this kind of national imagination, this horizontal flat community where everybody's a citizen in a nation. But instead of it being America or France, it's like Druze, Druzedom or Maronite them, or Sunni them, or Shia them. And then within each group, what that leads to is that all of the major political parties are just from one religion. And so like each community to varying degrees is like governed by like, in some cases, like a kind of dictator of that community. So you have like this group of, um, we call them Zaim, like local political bosses, sectarian leaders. And then like they kind of, uh, the, the power sharing agreement between them is like, is like the Lebanese government, right? Is what is kind of the Taif Accords that ended the civil war and is kind of how Lebanon has functioned uh, more or less since the mid 19th century. And these ethno religious sects, they're not exactly indigenous. They're religious. I, I wouldn't say they're ethno. The, the only eth- they're not ethno religious. The only ethno religious community would be the Armenians who came okay. after the Armenian genocide. Yeah. So these, these sects, we'll use that kind of yeah. language, the sects aren't actually indigenous to Lebanon. As far as I understand, no, they, they're kind of artificial creation of the sort of post-colonial settlement where you might be a part of a community, for example, that doesn't have a civil law. Well, you better get one because yeah. now you're going to be a sect. Kind of. how, how does that work? How, how do these things originate? Yeah, I mean, it's, um, it's funny you should bring that point up because um, in the Christian case, um, as well as in the Druze case, there wasn't a civil law on hand, unlike um, the Sunni and Shia, who each had their own kind of version of Sharia law that they had been using to govern uh, civil affairs. In the Druze case, there, although, of course, there had been, and in the Christian case, kind of religious um, management of civil affairs, there was no civil code. 
as such, there was no equivalent of Sharia law for the Druze or for the Christians. And thus, part of the formulation of modern Lebanon was uh, this kind of creation of a Christian civil law code on the one hand and a Druze uh, civil law code on the other. What is new is this nationalization of the religious identity. This, so when national identity, uh, rather religious identity, sectarian identity becomes the primary mode through which you relate to others or through which you define yourselves as a community. I think in the older times, people were, were um, linked together by kinship, by kinship structures. Um, oftentimes what gets neglected in a lot of anthropology, I think, I was discussing this with a friend, is that like the importance of great families. Because I think the, the European mind thinks of things as, you know, uh, or in general today, we think of things as like the history of religions. And Lebanon has also talked about the history of sects. But that isn't really a good way to look at Lebanon before like 1850. And even till today, it's like the history of great houses. And in Arabic, literally, when you say, what family are you from? They ask, what house are you from? So that's in the language you say, I'm from the house of whatever, house of Versailles. So um, I think like there were different mechanisms, different intersecting modes of relation. And what happens in the mid 19th century, and this is all from Usama Mekdesi's work. He wrote a great book called The Cultural of Sectarianism. And his thesis, which has a lot of truth to it. I mean, it's been it's been challenged uh, to some degree, but I think definitely there's a lot of truth in it in that there's a fundamental shift in the early 19th century where because British and French were looking at these Lebanese communities as religions, local elites started realizing that in order to secure aid, secure arms, secure political or economic power, it was best to speak in the language of religion. And as a result, you had this consolidation of these kind of homogeneous um, ethnic, uh, religious communities that kind of formed. And then you have this, this effort in, I think it's 1840 or 1843, where they divide Mount Lebanon between a Maronite section in the North and a Druze section in the South. And that like leads to ethnic cleansing. And, all and that who's ethnic. the they in that? In it's that the sense. Ottomans, the Ottomans, the Ottomans. Uh, I believe. Yeah. Per, per, perhaps in uh, participation with local, with local elites. And so, so you start having this, this idea of, you know, that, that a territory should be one religion, right? In the same way, in a national imagination, French territory should be you know, strictly French. That didn't exist as much before, but then that, that becomes an aspect of the sectarian imagination. It plays a huge role in the Civil War where, okay, this Druze area should be for the Druze, right? This Christian area should be for the Christian, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Where are then different families, you know, uh, loyal to different tribal confederations almost, right? Right. Yeah. So I want to ask, I want to get into the Druze specifically. Yeah, sure. But before that, I want to ask one more general question about Lebanon. And this kind of comes up when we discuss the Middle East or the Levant in general, which is there's a kind of a debate about, well, who is really responsible for the political situation? Sure. And I, I had somebody get mad on me on Twitter the other day because I was just uh, bashing America for, you know, decimating Western Asia and, and creating these situations of just wild instability where, mm. for example, the population of Christians in the 21st century in the Middle East has just collapsed, right? Right. And uh, this guy was like, well, you're just blaming America, but what about these, you know, local people with their extremism or with their, you know, corrupt governments or with their tyranny, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. And I think it's kind of insane to not see the colonial powers as like ultimately responsible, but they're in a very real sense you know, France is no longer directly governing Lebanon. It has its own system. And so when we get into this question about like the civil war and all these other things, how do you relate this, you know, Ottoman, French, colonial legacy to the actual politics of today where we have these, you know, we have these bosses, as you mentioned, these sectarian right. bosses, they're doing stuff. Where, right. where is really the, what's keeping the system going, I guess? Where do we, how do we make sense of all the problems that Lebanon is facing? Is it, is it just the, the legacy of colonialism? Is it something else? I think the legacy of colonialism writ large is beyond Lebanon, is the militarization of states. So the emphasis on creating a strong national um, military that then kind of suppresses the country and holds it in this kind, and the extreme emphasis on centralization, because the Ottomans are actually excellent managers of diversity. Not to say that there wasn't a lot of that there wasn't uh, brutality in the Ottoman Empire, but it was not a continuous surveillance state. It was uh, moments of, of brutality interspersed with long moments of, of uh, 
of relative quiet. So um, what you see is the emphasis. I think what you the big problem in that in the Middle East is this emphasis on militarism, heavy urbanization, uh, centralization, overcrowded cities, and everything being kind of bent to the will of of the capital. You know, Damascus in the case of Syria, Baghdad in the case of Iraq, etc. So I think that um, is definitely a legacy of colonialism. But I think even when colonialism was in its heyday, in order for it to work, it required the participation of local elites. The, the colonialists created created a kind of game, right? But local elites had to buy into it and um, re, you know, realize that there were benefits in playing this game in order for it to work. And I think today the system is being sustained not by uh, is being sustained by the collaboration between local elites and foreign powers, of which is not just America, but uh, regional powers are like Saudi Arabia, Iran, uh, Turkey, etc., and global powers like the United States, Russia, maybe in the future China. But I think the it begins actually with the local elites and then works its way out. It's I, I don't think it's um, foreign powers kind of playing risk and just moving people around. I think it's I think local elites establish a kind of um, they kind of they say okay I'm the guy to do business with it's easier and then regional powers and global powers support them. And when regional global regional powers support them, it makes it impossible for a local revolution to topple them because you can't, what are you going to do against regional powerhouses or global powerhouses? Right. So um, I think it's more about that. It begins at, I think at the national local level and then different foreign powers by into. So we had this sort of escalation of, tensions and conflicts in Lebanon between these various sects, leading to an outbreak of civil war, where you had, you know, regional powers like Israel, you had colonial powers like the United States, you know, off the the coast or whatever. And the Druze, I mean, there are a million people, more or less, correct? Yeah. And they're kind of clustered in this particular region. Just kind of speak about the Druze situation. How do they relate politically to, to the rest of Lebanon? Yeah, that's an interesting question. So the Druze begin a millennium ago. 2017 was our thousand year anniversary. They begin to understand their religious origins, which we can also get, there's a lot to get into, but we can get into that later. But they start in the Fatimid dynasty, which is at that time the biggest non Sunni caliphate, Ismaili caliphate, centered around one particular uh, caliph by the name of Hakim bin Amrullah. They uh, are a kind of religion that emerges inside of Ismailism comes out of it. Almost a certain political tendency that also interfaces with being a religion. Long story short, they find themselves that most of their adherents, even though it began in Cairo, but but formulated by by a, a very cosmopolitan group of people, people from Iran and Uzbekistan and all parts of the Islamic world kind of formulated the religion. But the adherents were um, Arabs from what is today, uh, you call it greater Syria, you know, uh, Lebanon, um, Israel, Palestine, Syria, Jordan, etc. That's where the Druze are today. Uh, how they define themselves, you know, each community is very different. I think in Lebanon, they've had a very unique kind of role where this is very, sounds a bit cliche to people who read Lebanese history, but, you know, the, a lot of different pa- people in Lebanon, obviously sects have different foreign backers. So the Shia for a long time, had this relationship with Iran, uh, not just in the modern age, but also not just in the contemporary age, but in the entire modern age. That's like the last, during the Sabafid Empire, which was the big, um, one of the three gunpowder empires, they call them, along with the Mughal and Ottoman Empire. Uh, and obviously the uh, Christians, particularly the Maronites, had a longstanding relationship with Western Europe, first the Catholic Church itself, and then later on France. So the Druze never really had a clear ally, and so that uh, allowed them to be a bit mercurial in their uh, political tendencies. For a time, they were kind of allied to England in the 19th century, and then under um, Kamal Jimblat, who was the main Druze kind of leader, Zaim of the Druze in the 20th century, late 20th century, he kind of allied the Druze with um, the non-aligned movement, you know, so linking about China, uh, India, you know, these kind of neither, neither, neither East nor, uh, or neither, neither, so, you know, neither East nor West type thing. So the Druze were always trying to define themselves against both the broader Islamic backdrop from which they emerged, but also uh, they couldn't just, they're not just going to copy 
or absorb European uh, culture like, to some degree, the, the Christians have. So they're always trying to search for this kind of unique third way out. I mean, I think that's a big part of modern Druze identity in Lebanon is like this kind of third wayism somehow. Um, even in the religion, I think that's, I try to argue that's why reincarnation becomes very important in the 20th century because it provides a, a way for Druze to distinguish themselves both from other Muslims, let's assuming we think we say that Druze are Muslim, distinguish them from other Muslims and from Christians, right? By emphasizing this kind of belief that actually has more in common with India and China and Buddhism and Hinduism than it does with Christianity, Judaism, Islam. So, um, yeah, that, that's, and then, and then the Druze politically become allied, uh, pretty closely with the Soviet Union. Um, I would say for, and that continues through Willie Jimblot, the son of Kamal Jimblot. It's through the civil war, the, 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 uh, the Druze are the, the progressive socialist party, which is the major political party of the Druze. It has socialist origins, but it's more or less a sectarian party that represents the Druze the way other parties represent other sects. That is close to the Soviet Union. Uh, then Willie Jim Blatt has a turn has a turn in 2005, kind of throws his weight behind America and George Bush. So the Druze are, we bounce around really they don't, um, because they're small and they don't have a clear foreign backer the way the Shia do or the Christians do, let's say, you know, or the Sunnis who are the majority in, in the region. So this, this question of reincarnation is very interesting. We have these Ismaili, what's the term? The, these Ismaili mm-hmm. dies going around and sort of preaching this, this new interpretation or this new vision of their faith. They consolidate as this community. And how does the, where does the reincarnation part come from? How does that fit in? Yeah, it's very interesting to, you know, oftentimes language forces us to call a di- different phenomenon by the same word because we have no other word to describe them. And you can't, like, for example, there's the whole that God, what is, is the conception of God and, and, you know, sure. in Abrahamic faith, the same as in Hinduism. So it's the same for reincarnation. Um, uh, reincarnation means different things. There's different words and it has different origins. Um, in, in Arabic, you have um, two different words to describe reincarnation, at least. You have takammus uh, and tanassuk. Takammus comes from the word kamis, uh, amis, shirt, means like changing your shirt, is a human, is a scheme of reincarnation that is human only. Tanassuk is also human, re- human to human reincarnation, but it's part of a larger scheme that includes. Uh, reincarnation to like it's like so it doesn't just have tanasuch, but it has like masach, rasach, wasach, which means like you know could be animals, minerals, plants. So it's uh, you know so tanasuch nasach is just human to human, but there's wasach. So there's so in tanasuch it's transmigration as opposed to reincarnation. Basically, human to human reincarnation with a larger schema that includes different classes of beings from like starting with humans under it animals under it like rodents and like insects under that plants minerals so a human soul will only reincarnate as a human soul in druze but in like for example alawi alawites which is another sect uh, also in syria exists it's one of the four islamic sects in lebanon but it's very small um obviously you know bashar al-assad is alawite in that religion uh, they have reincarn. They have tanasuch, so they have human to human reincarnation, but within a schema where no, actually, if you're a bad person, you can come back as an animal, and then if you're a bad animal, you come back as a plant, and so on and so forth until you become like inorganic material. I see. So for the Druze, can new human souls? There's like a finite number of human souls that are constantly. Yeah, that's the dogma. The dogma says that there's a finite number of human souls because, uh, basically, in in so the Druze belief of reincarnation is is different from of the Alawi and even of the, the Hindus because you don't go up and down in like scales of being. You just stay human and you reincarnate into human beings no matter what. It's not a function of how you conduct yourself. It's like a fact of law. And, uh, uh, and that comes out of Neoplatonism. So actually the Druze belief in reincarnation, um, I would have to do more research into other Islamic sects like the Ahl al-Haq or the Alawites, but for the Druze certainly... Their belief in reincarnation can be traced to Ismaili thinking, but in turn, Ismaili thinking that is, is emerging out of Neoplatonism and Gnosticism. 
so it has to do with the reincarnation as conceived in like Pythagoras. Interesting. Right? right. And so what that has to do with is not so much a soul kind of jumping around from body to body, but actually the irreducible materiality of the spiritual world, which is to say that the, the, the spiritual world cannot be ripped away from the material. Uh, the, the, yeah, the spiritual can only be apprehended through the material world, which is to say, so like the, the, the clothes, not even the clothes, like the, in a similar way that, you know, you can't, one cannot perceive meaning without a word to define it, right? I can't communicate. So a word is the body. The meaning is the soul. Uh, the, the, you cannot perceive the sun without the light that shines from it. So that's the idea. Uh, so the, the idea is that the, that the, the, the human body is the manifestation of the soul in that, in that sense. And so as the soul is eternal, therefore it must always have a body. Uh, and so there will always be a body for the soul, hence reincarnation, hence between lives. Again, this is the Druze idea. There is no separation. So as soon as one dies, he is instantly reincarnated. Right. Because the, 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 the soul always demands to have a body. Uh, uh, it, would, it must always be perceivable through a body because only through a body can the soul actualize itself in, in any sort of way. Mm -hmm. And when you're that, speaking that is, of a body, it has to be a material body. Human body. Yeah. Okay. Human body. Human body. Like a fleshly body, like with skin and bone. Yeah. Okay. A fleshly body of humans. Mm. And, 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 then, and then why it's uh, consistent is that, you know, at the time when the Druze call was made, the people who signed the contract and said, okay, we're Druze, they reincarnate as Druze forever. I see. And then people who did not reincarnate as non-Druze forever. I see. So it's actually every – you don't have a problem of evangelism because everybody was given the opportunity. Correct. Or at least a certain number of the elect were given the opportunity to reject or accept the call. Precisely. I see. Interesting. But, but also it's important to understand that the Druze also believe that there are other Druze in the world because it's not about being Druze. Druze – People, Druze actually don't like being called Druze because... Uh, I see. What do they like to it's be called? Muahideen, which means Unitarians. Because Druze is actually the name of a guy who was later considered a heretic and killed. But because he, he, he was a big evangelist at that time and proselytized and converted a lot of people, his name became associated with the religion. I see. A guy by the name of Nishkatana Derezi. So who, these, um, these Lebanese Unitarians... What? So yeah, so there could be Unitarians in other parts of the world. I see. So 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 it, it, so a lot of Druze do believe that there are definitely like Druze communities with other names. They don't call themselves Druze in India or in China or you know wherever else. So how so politically how does this shake out? Because there seems to be this. If you're always the thing with always reincarnating as human continuously, I feel like this would have really a profound impact on how you relate to society. No. Yeah, um, it definitely – so the stereotype or the, the common thing that people have said in, in the little bit of anthropology that exists on the subject, although there isn't too much, it's starting now, um, is that it just strengthens like you know community bonds. It makes Druze closer together because I could potentially be your brother. I could potentially be your sister, you know, your, your father, your friend. Doesn't that make like and marriage it, and the family a little bit complicated? <laughs> Somewhat, yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, you, yeah. You might actually be my sister. I've no, how do I know? Right, 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 right. <laughs> right. Uh, that, yeah. That I, I haven't, I haven't encountered any cases where it happened on that incestual level. But I've definitely had a case where a guy was the reincarnation of his own older brother. Oh no! Well, his older brother died like around the same time that he, he the kid was born. Really interesting. So like, yeah, so he was like, "I am my older brother." <laughs> That's wild, right? Um, yeah. So, pe I mean, people really do believe. You know, they they now in the religion actually, there's a big debate over whether or not you can remember your past life. So, to me, that's it's more of a folk phenomenon. This phenomenon of remembering your past life, because in the actual religion. Um, according to a lot of the religious establishment, especially the religious establishment that's recognized by the state, the official religious establishment, and in a lot of Druze sacred writings, reincarnation is downplayed. It also creates, and that, I'm going to go through the stereotypes and then I'm going to go through what I think is a different way of analyzing it, which doesn't contrast to the, the, the other things, but it complements them. Um, the, you know, this idea that basically, okay, reincarnation also makes the Druze fearless. 
because you know you're not going to die. You're gonna you know the, you know there's a common battle cry that we will be born. Your mother is already is already pregnant with you, right? You know, you're already, uh, you're going to be born, you, you will go to, you know, you'll wake up in your mother's uh, arm, you, you know, in your mother's um, lap. Uh, so there's this idea of communal solidarity. They say we were born in each other's houses. It's another quote. Uh, and then there's also this idea of like not fearing death because you're going to be reborn. And then that leads to all kinds of funky things like martyrs who are alive, like living martyrs, because like I died in my past. I was a martyr in my past life and here I am. So you cannot, you, these all kinds of these tropes of bravery, warriorhood that are strong and, and communal solidarity are very strongly associated with the Druze. Do the theological characteristics, because you were mentioning there's a difference between the folk uh, conception and the kind of uh, scholarly or, you know, scholastic or religious conception. Uh, according to like the official theology, so to speak, do the characteristics of the, the soul mutate or are they also like constant so for example could uh could i be reincarnated as a druze like as a as a woman as a if i'm a brave man could i become a coward if i'm a weak man could i become a strong man like how does this work right 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 um okay the two constants are you stay druze and you stay within the same gender now there are some uh, modern Druze who try to reinterpret, you know, transsexuality as being like, you know, a case of like the gender went in the wrong. Uh, right. So I mean, you can have modern spins on it, but I think in the orthodox uh, idea, generally speaking, it's it, the idea is it's the same gender, same religion. So it's the same gender, but you don't necessarily carry over memory, or You're, it's it, you know. it's unclear whether you carry over memory. But a lot of orthodox would tell you, no, you don't, you don't. Because were you to do so, you would partake in divine knowledge, and then and if you were to take in, partake in divine knowledge, the universe would collapse. <laughs> okay, so yeah. okay, that's that's interesting. Yeah, All right. Yeah. <laughs> so we, you know, part of your research covered cases of this sort of discourse around reincarnation during and after the Civil War. Right. Can you sort of flesh that out a little bit? Sure. So the part of again going back to the folk idea. So in in my in my in my uh, work, I try to, in the first uh, section, chapter, just to provide an overview, I, I, I treat the uh, phenomenon of reincarnation as a belief. So I treat it discursively. So I, I trace its origins, its development um, in the sacred texts. And then I talk about the discourses of both different elements of the Druze religious establishment, how they relate themselves to reincarnation as a belief, um, some who... Uh, downplay it, emphasize it, etc. I try to hypothesize why. I talk about how non-initiates, including Kamal Jimblat, but also various others, people in the diaspora, people in search of defining a Druze identity have used reincarnation. What's a non-initiate? It's very important to discuss that actually before we get into it. So in the religion, there are initiates and non-initiates. So uh, roughly, there's no statistics, hard statistics on this, but I'll throw out a figure, 10%, let's say of the community are initiates. So that means that they basically practice the religion. They carry the religion on behalf of the non-initiates or the remaining 90%. So among the initiates, um, they actually pray. They convene on Thursday nights in a meeting place called the Chalwa. It's a little bit like Quakers almost. Like it's kind of meeting house where they sit and they pray together. Um, they, have, they are permitted access to the sacred texts. And they practice different kinds of, uh, of things. They fast during Eid al-Adha. Eid al-Adha is the is an Islamic holiday, but also the only Druze holiday, religiously speaking. They fast like this week before that. You know, they, so they have these different kinds of traditions that they hold. They dress a certain way. And men and women can be initiates. So unless you're initiated, you can be Druze like in a nominal sense, but you have no actual religious observant yeah. obligation or basically, anything like that? Basic, ba well, yeah, you, you have these religious obligations, but they're actually just cultural obligations. So actually what's interesting is that if you're a non-initiate, your modality of accessing the sacred is through being a good figure in society. You don't do specific religious things, right? You, it, it's like, it's like being, so I, I try to, I try to make this argument that like Drew's religiosity for non-initiates is intimately linked to the material world. I see. In, in all of its aspects. So it's like an so ethical or moral system. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And so that means that like, you should be honest, you should take care of your fellow brethren, 
you should marry a Druze woman, certainly. Um, you're encouraged to not sell your land because land is also sacred. These are in the old old way. Could you, you know? You could you uh, a farmer. blaspheme? Could you like be nominally Druze and like uh, I don't know? Do Druze have a concept of blasphemy? I mean, like like cursing or sin, engaging in sinful activity. Yeah, like could you? Or, or for example, would it be a sin for a Druze to like be a Sunni also? Yeah, of course. I mean, now. So what's interesting? Let's get another argument that we can. Do. I'm assuming if you're not initiate, right? So you're not initiated into the Druze mysteries. But you just like go to a Sunni mosque. No, you mosque can do that. Whatever, that but right? that's part of like takia. That's part of the idea of like um, you can blend in to the dominant religious group. So you could also go to church and pray. You, you, you're, you're, it's okay to blend in with the dominant religious faction. Yes. And also, I mean, the Druze don't really see themselves in a the way. The Druze are not really a religion. Somehow, they're like kind of a in a, 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 a mystical kind of creed or something. So, mm -hmm. so if you can blend in with the dominant group politically as a unit, do the Druze have any interest in dominance or preeminence within Lebanon? No, because they're too small. Mm -hmm. um, they did when Lebanon was Mount Lebanon. So when there was an area that was kind of loosely defined, it was never stable borders, but there was like a kind of a, it's not even a principality, but like a kind of um, an area of taxing of it an area where certain governors um, who were from the same family were like had their taxing rights over a certain region. Within that area, which was um, made up with Druze and Maronites, the Druze did want dominance. And that's what led to a lot of conflict in, you know, um, in the mid-19th century uh, between Druze and Christians. But in today's day and age, the mere fact that Druze are able to keep the amount of seats that they have in parliament, honestly, and the amount of ministers that they had is already, you know, it's more than their number. So what did, what did the Druze in Lebanon politically want? They want to stay relevant. They just want to be relevant. They want to, because, because the Druze are much smaller than the other three. Mm -hmm. Do they you feel, know, they, are they threatened? Who's their enemy? Are they stable, safe? Are they in now, decline? Um, they don't, they try not to have any hard enemies mm -hmm. because that, you know, that could be dangerous for them. Because they're in a kind safe. of marginal geographic position, right? No, no, on the contrary. They're, the, the Druze area is in the center of Lebanon. So they're not on the, I mean, they're not, they're not, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. And actually Beirut was kind of Druze feudal land in the, in the old days. So you could argue that Druze is, that the Lebanon is a, is a Druze embryo implanted with Maronite sperm <laughs> in the sense that, and that sounds very weird. But what I mean by that is like, it's a Christian project on Druze real estate. That's, that's the blueprint. That's the center of Lebanon. Obviously Lebanon has expanded to include other areas with their own unique histories. And a big problem in the construction of modern Lebanese identity is that we don't take into account those other histories. We base Lebanon's history on the Druze and the Christian role. Because of the Christian role in building Lebanon politically, economically, and the Druze role in it being that modern, like the center of Lebanon was, was Druze land to some degree. So, so, so Druze and Lebanon, Druze and Christians are central players, but like, Tripoli, which was the biggest city in what is today Lebanon for hundreds of years, but it's not considered part of Lebanese history. It's a kind of Syrian history because it was like a Syrian city, but it's actually uh, for until like 150 years ago was a bigger city than Beirut. Mm -hmm. or, then or, they, somebody somewhere, some British guy or what French guy drew some borders, and now in 1920, under the French mandate, they expanded it. They expanded Lebanon to include the north, Tripoli, the Beka Valley. And, and the South, which is predominantly Shia. And so also like the Shia, for example, have never really had a place in like classical Lebanese history because their community was in, a, in, in the Southern periphery. So there's a big issue of center periphery, obviously, in Lebanon as well. And so the Druze, the Druze are actually in the, in, in the center to some degree. And so how but does this play Druze, out? Druze, Druze prominence in Lebanon, I think, is a question of, to a large degree, a question of their, of their geography. Mm. So they occupy this kind of uh, strategic center and then the country yeah, yeah. descends into civil war. So just narrate that briefly. How does that play out for the Druze? Um, the civil war is so complicated and it has so many different facets. Uh, just the Druze perspective in it. Well, the Druze are central players in it. So, you know, even in that sense, they, they there could be a lot to say. Um, the Druze begin, so Kamal Jumblat is the leader of the Lebanese national movement which is kind of the main um, pan-Arab leftist 
kind of pro-Palestinian, because there's like three fault lines that the Civil War falls on. One is a left-right fault line. One is a pro, one is a, not pro or anti, but are we going to help fight Israel from Lebanon or not? Um, so kind of an isolationist versus pan-Arab mentality around the question of armed Palestinian militants. That's a second axis. And then a third axis is like Muslim Christian political participation. And th- these, these questions fall in different ways. But like uh, Kamal Jamblat was an ally of a lot of the, some of the radical leftist political movements. He's also an ally of the Palestinian Liberation Organization and try- became like a representative of the Muslim street, quote unquote. Um, against the kind of Christian establishment in Lebanon, right-wing Christian establishment. So he played a central role in uh, the two in, in, the, in, in the civil war, which began a bit more cleanly between kind of two sides. I mean, even then it wasn't so clean, but kind of two sides. Then he dies. Um, he's assassinated in 1977 by the Syrian government, uh, most likely. Uh, in, fact, in fact, by the Syrian government. Would this be uh, Papa Assad? Yeah, Papa, of course. Mm -hmm. Um, And then that's in 77. And then at that point, when Waleed Jumblat, his son, takes over the party, it becomes more of a Drew sectarian party. So there's a shift between a national kind of loosely pan-Arab left-wing attempt to reimagine Lebanon and place Lebanon within a non-aligned framework versus a pro-Western framework. Uh, towards a more narrow uh, sectarian imagination, which is like, let's just guarantee the survival and hegemony of the Druze on Druze territory. And then that opens up like a kind of this mountain war where the Druze engage in quite ferocious fighting with um, Christian forces and the Lebanese army in uh, the mountain ranges. And then you have like, you know, ethnic cleansing and kind of this effort to construct a homogeneous uh, Druze territory, particularly in the Shuf, in the Shuf mountains, which is the the power base of, of the of the of the of the Jimblot clan and of the Druze. And so, so if we can uh, telescope to the end of the war, because I know there's lots of things we could discuss, but you know, as a documentary filmmaker, you've produced several films about different, you know, conflicts all over the world. People can go and look at your research if they want more details. But just telescoping towards the end, how does the, the civil war end up for the Druze and how what does the Druze, you know, bring us to today, I guess, with the Druze and what what's going on with them? There's a Drew saying where they say they always win the they win militarily, but they lose politically. So the Druze are good at winning. The stereotype is the Druze are good at winning the battle. They win the war, but somehow politically they they lose power over time, and economically they they lose out. And I think that's actually true in this case. Uh, the, the Druze, I mean, won they won the war of the mountain militarily, um, and the mere fact that they're still kind of relevant politically in the Lebanese state, I think is kind of a victory for them relative to how small their numbers are compared to the other communities. But that being said, I mean, their situation is not enviable, nor is it for any community in Lebanon. I mean, this is where the progressive revolutionary Malik comes out. But I mean, everybody's suffering under the kind of class uh, politics of Lebanon and the Druze are no different. So I think, I mean, the Druze The situation are, right now is terrible still, right? Terrible, I mean, it's been yeah. in a kind of crisis for some time. It's terrible for everybody. The Druze are no exception. So, I mean, it's, uh, you know, most Druze are actually kind of quite poor. Um, the mountain area, even though the Druze like won militarily in it is actually way worse off today than it was even, I think before the civil war in many ways, at least it would appear there. It's uh, this, um, well, I don't know what the poverty rates are, so I don't want to glorify Lebanon before the Civil War, but it's certainly like, you know, not not doing well economically. Um, even visually, it's become, you know, parts of Ale and, you know, certain Druze areas are uh, you just, you can just see the kind of waste and destitution that's there. They're not, um, they don't look like they're doing well. So, and and Druze families are quite, you know, there's quite a lot of poverty um, in the Druze community, as there is even more so in other communities. So, although the Druze did win, in a sense, militarily, and they also did win, in a sense, politically, they didn't lose power after the Civil War. They they gained more power as a community. Um, I I would say economically and socially, they're not doing well as as no one else is. So, it also depends, like, how you want to look at the Druze. If you want to look at the Druze as like this block unit of the Druze, like a risk game, you know, like it, it's like saying is 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 America doing good if American citizens are poor, but America is a world power kind of thing. 
that mentality. So like the Druze as like a Druze unit, I think came out of the civil war on top. But what does that mean for Druze people, right? For actual Druze families and human beings and not much. And how does this relate to their, what, what do you think, if any relation, does all of this play with their actual worldview or beliefs? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, well, that's what I'm trying to, I'm trying to, to, to figure out. I'm, I, I try to basically, um, in the third chapter of my book, uh, of my book, of my, of my paper, and what I've tried to push, you know, in general, uh, in, or this idea, not push, this idea that I've been exploring for a long time is these two contrasting modes of Druze and potentially world, uh, different communities, how they can relate to each other. So you have this, what I call the national imagination, which is this sectarian, uh, sorry, this um, kind of idea of an imagined citizenship, this kind of flattening out of difference and this kind of anom- a- anonymity within a certain categorical framework. So the Druze are just replaceable. They're all the same within this category of Druze. And this, this national imagination, if you follow, it's, it's, it's replicatable everywhere. And it's, it's, it, even though the name changes, it has the same genetically, right? It's the same. At a base level, it's the same. It has the same, uh, the same basic anatomy. So Maronite sectarianism is the same as Shia sectarianism, the same as Druze sectarianism, in, in the same way as somehow French nationalism is at heart the same as American nationalism, Chinese nationalism. Obviously, in superficial ways, it's different, but at the core, it's the same structure of community. And I try to contrast this with this idea of imagined kinship or uh, even nicer um, brotherhood of the breath. This idea that actually our relations are necessarily specific because I could, it's not just, oh, we're all Druze. No, I am potentially your brother, potentially your friend, potentially your comrade, potentially your enemy. So there's this potentiality that is inherently specific that is actualized when people remember their past lives. And as such, I don't think that discourses of reincarnation can just be brought to heel and absorbed within a national framework. I actually think they have their own autonomous logic. And so I think, and I, so I think there is something redeeming about the specific specificity um, of, of, of this kind of imagined kinship embodied or actualized in reincarnation. And that's also linked to a wider idea of Drew's sacred materiality, which I, which I contrast with the flatness of national imagination. So, for example, and this, this has parallels in other work I've done with Native Americans, for example, in contrasting Native American ideas of community with national ideas of community. Right. So, um, uh, and, and I shouldn't even say Native American because each tribe is different, and that's what makes tribal understandings different from national understandings. Tribal understandings are not the same in the same way that national understandings globally are the same. Uh, that, so this, so this, this idea of imagined kinship is uniquely Druze. It, it's not replicatable in other communities, whereas Druze sectarianism is the same as Maronite, you know, at heart as Maronite sectarianism or, or Shia sectarianism or whatever. So I'll give you an example of... Um, so normally when people die you, in a war and they come back as Druze, you'd imagine that that would like lead to like a strengthening of like Druze kind of tribe, like Druze patriotism. Like I died from my community, I'll come back. And oftentimes that's the case, no doubt. But it doesn't always have to be that way. So example, I count and count a person. And what's interesting is he's the closest, he bears the closest relationship to his previous family, right? So this is a young kid who imagines himself, believes himself to be the reincarnation of a guy who died in another battle that happened, you know, the same year he was born. And this young kid grew up close to the family of that guy's children who have no father, right? And he describes how he, even though he's younger than them, he played the role of the father for them growing up. Like he's very close to them. And to this day, he's very close to them, right? But rather than that leading to him being more warlike or more ready to fight or more proud of his Jewish identity, it led to him being disgusted with the civil war disgusted with the political party of the Druze, disgusted with Druze sectarianism, 
So for him, he's like, because I saw the loss of these kids growing up without a father and I had to play that role, I feel in a sense, I regret what I did in my past life and I wouldn't do it again. And so, 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 so reincarnation undermines sectarian logic. So, so even though he, he believes in, in, in reincarnation, he's super close to his Druze family, you don't know that reincarnation narratives, they're fundamentally unpredictable. And no one can really, I mean, we have a question when we discuss like traditions or communities of, you know, who counts as in or out, right? Who counts as Druze or not Druze? Who counts as Sunni or not Sunni? But this is even a deeper question because like who, who is the arbiter of who is reincarnated as who and how can they interpret that? It just seems like this kind of escape hatch where there's actually no, <laughs> nobody right. can really con- control this. Well, that's what makes it so fascinating. Phenomenon. That's what makes it so fascinating. It's kind of, yeah. it's this weird kind of ritual that is self-managed by the community, but there's no person who's like the, has agent, like is the agenitive, you know, manager of it. So yeah, I, I actually try to argue that it is a kind of, I try to argue uh, also in my paper that like, um, I like to expand, expand on this more in my doctoral research, is this idea that reincarnation is kind of a, um, if you will, a tradition of the un- uninitiated. But it is an informal tradition. It has no formal religious, it's not like, right. Well, it can't be formalized. I mean, you couldn't, you couldn't like pass property between lives because there's right, no way right. to establish it. It's a supernatural right. phenomenon, right, right, right. so you can't like – you know what I mean? So how, how could right, it ever I, be a formalized process? It could right. only and ever I, be I, a I kind also, of And I think belief. it's chaotic element. It's very chaotic. I think that chaos, chaos is because it is linked so deeply to the materiality of the, not, of the non-initiated lifestyle. Uh, because basically the only moment of sacredness in the life of a Druze when they're in touch with anything sacred, like communion would be or praying five times a day or going to Mecca, is at the moment of death. In funerals, which everybody has to go to, even if you barely knew the person, it's very like required. And again, that goes to the, the link between cultural obligation or social obligation and religious obligation in the life of the non-initiated. When you go to a funeral, the, the sheikhs, the religious figures, pray on the coffin. That's the only time you see them pray as a non-initiated. It's at the moment of death. And if you're, and if you, they don't pray on you, it's a big shame, right? It's like being, it's like, it's like, yeah, it's like a rever- it's like a death, oh. it's like a baptism at the time of death, almost, yeah. So, I so see. there's something holy there, right? But then that that kind of sacredness gets reinterpreted into reincarnation. It's, it's a. I see. So the the sheikhs are like this. Are they the right. e- uh, e- so, esoteric so what, part of the religion? The, the, the lay people, they're yeah, the exactly. purely Somehow. exoteric part. And it, it, there's, there's one yes. moment where the two and, are but linked. what happens is, so after, it's all about death. It's, necro, it's kind of necropolitics. After death, um, if, you're, if you're initiated of a high rank, your, your tombstone becomes a kind of sacred site that the uninitiated can visit. But there is no time where they have to visit it. So they visit it whenever they want, but it's this kind of clean... Uh, 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 established, located space where the holiness or sacredness of that life can be accessed. But if you're uninitiated, the equivalent of that is these reincarnation narratives. Uh, and what's funny is that because because the, the uninitiated are in the mortal in the mortal coil, so to speak, the, the, all of the uh, what is emphasized in actually in reincarnation narratives is unholy things. So it's, yeah, so it's all about what, what people usually remember is like stuff having to do with violence, sex, money. It, it's all things that are actually kind of unclean. Things that are very, very uh, profane. It's like kind of this reinscribing of the profane into the sacred. Because it's a sacred ritual of the profane, of the non-initiated. So like how do people – what are the normal tropes that come back and forth in reincarnation narratives? It's, it's things like I buried my money here. you know, And money is, is actually very unclean in the Druze religion. Real religious high-level people should not touch money, right? Or that night where I got drunk, you know, that night where I slapped you, 
to slap my wife, right? I buried my gun here. So what, what the stuff, that, or, or, or someone saying, for example, to his mom, you're not pretty. My wife is prettier than you. Yeah. It, it's oh. all this kind of uh, liminal violation of norms through this things that are in a, that are so profane they're inappropriate is it a is it a sense of guilt for mean? the past life cuz you mentioned this uh this boy mm-hmm. who had a regret for his mm-hmm. past life and his role in the war so does it does it usually manifest no, as a guilt that's or is it a, is it a it's possible but it's not guilt that's rare. It, what 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 the, the, that mm-hmm. story was particular um uh, and obviously c- certain stories are particular, but what, what emerges again and again is this profaneness, is this kind of ritualization of profane things. Constantly talking about violence as a way of memory. Constantly talking about money, where money was buried, where money was hidden, wills, inheritance, things that are kind of dirty. S- seen of as, you know, not, not clean. And, and I, I think that that's because it's a religious ritual linked to the uninitiated, linked to the the, the mortality of life, and then that, and that, and that has a lot to do with Drew's ideas that actually the physical and the material and the specific, because all materiality is specific, hence why it's material and not symbolic. Every 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 individual cup is different, but the idea of a cup is the same. Uh, the, the 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 inherent sacredness of materiality, I think, is 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 unique to the Drews, uh, or it's it's very specific. It's in Islam too. To some degree, which is why the Quran was never translated until you know relatively late in the game. Um, but I think, well, you you've mentioned this a couple of times. There's this specificity that there's these elements of the the situation that can't be replicated or translated elsewhere. So how how would uh I don't know. Let's say you're talking to some random Parisian. What are they to learn? You know what what can people that aren't Druze? I mean, is this just kind of a, an object of Oh, that's interesting. Or the what's kind of the takeaway? The takeaway as the great um, neo Confucian scholar, um, he had this great line where he says, "Broaden your, deepen your subjectivity in order to broaden your objectivity." So it's this idea that uh, deepening yourself within your social relations, within your world, within your your con- within that there is a that there is, and this is in Confucianism also. That, uh, but in Confucianism, it's explored more through moral self cultivation uh, than through sacredness in a in a in a in a holy Abrahamic sense of the term. But I, I think that the takeaway would be that there is a kind of that you you don't need to um, go into that you can go into aestheticism, and in fact, the sheikhs are all about the, the logic of the sheikh is to ab- absent yourself, abstain from anything to do that's human. So you don't eat, uh, obviously don't drink and try to fast, but they go further. Like you don't try not to sleep, you know, the higher up you go, you start like not sleeping. Um, you don't have sex with your wife, you know, not because sex is a sin, but because it's human. So you're just trying to abstract your things yourself from human activities. And the more you do that, the higher up you go. But there's also a kind of holiness on the non-initiated side to be fine by immersing yourself deep within your community. And so I think you can find the sacred roots of community and of working within your community in something as simple as cultivating the land. Because as I said before, so the, the soul manifests in the body and finds meaning in the body, but the, the body finds meaning through labor or work, you know, lab, but labor in, in the land, in, in agricultural cultivation, the transformation of the land via human intentionality, which is what agriculture is. It's the trans, transformation of land through human intentionality. Uh, yeah, so I, that, that's what I would say. I mean, if I, I was talking to someone who didn't know anything about the Druze and not just from a, I was in this interesting point of view, I would say that there is a kind of sacredness to be, to be, to be gained, not through transcendence, but through imminence, through deepening your, 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 um, talons, you know, into, into that, which into, into, into your social relationships, into, commu- into, into your communal relationships and finding a deep meaning there. Yeah. That's what I would say. Well, I, I feel like we're running up against the uh, time that we allotted for this. I really appreciate you coming on, Malik, and hope to have you back in the future to discuss oh. your future research. Where, If people are interested in learning more or uh, accessing your work, they where should they should go? They should go to – well, I, have, I don't have a website yet. I haven't done enough um, – you know, I just don't have a website. But 
if people are interested in another project I did, uh, so this Drew stuff yet is not, this is the first actually public, uh, or I should say in, I've done events, but this is the first kind of internet uh, release of my thoughts about reincarnation. So thank you very much for that. But um, if people are interested in just other work I've done, I would recommend them to the native and the refugee.com. The native and the refugee.com is another project I've done, which explores similar themes in a different way. It's a comparison, a multimedia research project that I did with another fellow by the name of Matt Peterson, who I also think has been on the, the podcast. Um, it concerns a comparison or a juxtaposition rather of native American Indian reservations and Palestinian refugee camps as forms of life, as ways of life, as geographies that reveal something ab about the national imagination, as I think reincarnation does, that problematize it, that question it. And uh, yeah, so that work is there. And you can learn more about that project on native and the refugee.com. But I hope down the line to have um, another kind of platform that 